Listen up, Roto Grinders. It's the ownership report for week number seven in NFL DFS. My name is Chris Gimino, projected ownership analyst at Roto Grinders, and joining me to go over the numbers for this week, we've got Dan Gasper, Mr. Tuttle 05 on Daily Fantasy Sites. Tuttle, are you ready to get down with this 10 game slate here? It's uh, you know similar setup to last week, 10 games, fewer people to go, a uh, little bit more concentration at the top, but it seems like it's going to be a pretty straightforward run here unless you've got a different take on things. No, I don't. And I think what I noticed is this week is even more concentrated to me than last week. I mean, not at the running back position. Obviously, last week we saw some extreme chalk at running back. Uh, but in terms of quarterback concentration um, and even wide receiver, I think it's it's going to be a little bit more, more heavy up top, um, which theoretically should be a contrarian player's dream, right? Um, but yeah. there are, it, it thins out pretty quickly in terms of uh, how strong plays are on this slate. Now, if you're pretty new to DFS or pretty new to watching a show like this, we're talking about the projected popularity of players here. So the P own here on my screen on lineup HQ, which is Roto Grinders Optimizer, is basically a percentage of the time that a player will appear in the overall rosters of the field. What we want to try to do with our rosters is try to get, obviously, high projected fantasy points because everybody likes fantasy points when you're playing fantasy football. But you also want to do a Ben Simmons and try to make yourself less popular while optimizing your fantasy points. So absolutely go ahead and watch a show like this. Go ahead and subscribe to Roto Grinders Premium. Check out the, you know, the various sources out there to see who you think might be popular in a given week and try to make sure that your lineup includes at least a couple of ways to make yourself a little bit different. Tuttle, let's talk quarterback for week seven. We got a couple of guys up top that I'm, I, you know, I see how it spit out here with Hertz at the top. And that's because we're, you know, we're, Pretty aggressive on the fantasy points for Hertz. That game environment should be pretty favorable for fantasy scoring with the Eagles and the Raiders. My concern with him appearing over someone like Lamar Jackson is that the price difference isn't that big. Lamar Jackson's far more popular to the masses. They both have similar skill sets with rushing. And, of course, I'm not so sure that everyone's got Hertz projected at the level that we do. So how how do you see the shaking out? Is it going to be Hertz or Jackson that – keys up at the top or someone else um we were talking a a tiny about this bit about this pre-show i think the distribution in general is is pretty okay um and i would not be surprised if it's either hurts or jackson as high as owned and the other guy that i wouldn't be surprised if started to see some steam from where we currently have him projected at is matthew stafford um i wouldn't i I think it's kind of going to be a big mess between the top four all within that that 10 to 15 percent range we'll see Hertz there Jackson Mahomes and Stafford I think um, and then I do think after that it's going to be a pretty significant drop off which is what we have projected yeah and you know I'm certainly going to be looking at someone like uh, now if you I've got my screen share up now if you look at what's going on here with Lamar Jackson uh, obviously, I think that his most popular site will be on DraftKings of the three sites. I think that Stafford might be the least popular on DraftKings compared to other sites, but I do think that the difference that I just flashed up here on Stafford will probably reduce uh, based on the feedback you're giving me here and based on just my general intuition of how easy it's going to be to stack someone like Stafford with, say, you know, you know, Robert Woods and Cooper Cup. Now, we are, there's also a popular running back on the Rams too, which could hold him back but that, that's where it gets a little bit tricky with these top couple of guys uh Hertz doesn't really have any kind of ambiguity there I mean there's you know you can you can ride him solo or you can run him with some cheap cheap stacking partners and that seems to be why he popped a little bit higher than the other guys on this run um Mahomes is the guy that I'm pretty sure is going to fall just below the top guys just because of how expensive that stack is do you agree with that yes I do agree with that yeah, any takes here as far as whether you like the idea of playing Mahomes this week or whether or not you want to go and pay the iron price for someone like a Tyreek Hill who's a little banged up and Mahomes? Yeah, um, so I, I came out pretty strong last week and was pretty strong on Mahomes over Lamar Jackson last week. Um, I do think, like, as a as a whole, Mahomes is, is the better overall play. Um but I'm not quite as sold on him being the pay up option this week or, or worth the extra money. I should say, um, like you said, the, his stack candidates are a little bit more expensive this week. 
Um, you mentioned Tyreek's banged up. I like. I actually like that <laughs> a little bit. We talked about it last week and, and kind of why we liked it. It reduced his ownership. Um, he he was limited. He he wasn't on the field a whole lot, but he still drew drew twelve targets and thirty five routes run, which is just a ridiculous target rate. Um, so like we know he's going to get targeted. The matchup is unbelievable for for Tyreek in the against this Tennessee secondary. Um, so like I, I think Mahomes is an excellent option for sure. Um, and I, like, I'm not going to say he's a bad play. I'm not going to say him and Tyreek are a bad stack. Uh, I just kind of prefer some of these lower priced options um, this week. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to those. They're, they're the lower owned price or yeah, the lower owned and lower priced options are kind of where I'm targeting my GPP exposure. Yeah. I would say other than Cordell Patterson at 8,000 on FanDuel, uh, their <laughs> site is also priced very efficiently. And I think on both, of these sites it's just going to be there's going to be some hard trade-offs between the highest projected guys like Alma Holmes uh, who is consequently more affordable relative to the salary cap on FanDuel than DraftKings but you know there's definitely some other choices to be made related to the salary cap we'll talk about that at the running back position in just a little bit I think that's where the chalk stops though I think it's Hurts it's Jackson it's Mahomes it's Stafford and then there's there's drop off I know Derek Carr is projecting well right now uh there, there are certainly places that like him better than others, but Rotor Grinders has a plenty high projection on him. And I'm still thinking that he'll get uh, some pretty decent ownership here, but I don't see anybody else beside that. I mean, do you think Tom Brady's going to rise up to the ranks here? Is anyone else you see going to possibly qualify as chalk? I do not think Tom Brady will at his price. I, I will say just in general um, with Antonio Brown out, the Brady double stacks are much easier to play now, right? Like we're not, we're not as worried um, about targets going elsewhere other than Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, basically like they're going to have a huge um, target share in this offense now. Uh, so like maybe that pushes Brady's ownership up a tad. Um, and I don't think it's going to be unique to stack Brady with, with those two guys this week uh, because it is, it's a pretty obvious play. Um, so I like, I think, I think he's a fine tournament option, but I, I do think it could be, hard to differentiate those Brady lineups because if you're, if you're playing Brady, it's, it's a, it's a double stack for me. Now, Tuttle, I want to tell you about something before we get onto the running back position. Now that we've discussed all the chalk at quarterback, if you are interested in checking out Roto grinders and you have not done so, you can try the Roto grinders NFL five day trial. It's a promo where obviously people can get in for zero. A note, it will be auto-converted to a monthly subscription at the end of the five days, but we're giving you five days that you can, of course, cancel before the renewal uh, and go ahead and try to get in and get some great content from Roto Grinders for NFL. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, drop the link in chat uh, in just a little bit. Producer, I don't know if you can help me out with that one. But again, if you, if you uh, don't uh, have uh, access to the chat right now, you're listening on the audio feed, rotogrinders.com slash premium slash NFL. And then you can go ahead and find the promo for the five-day trial there. Okay. Any other any other thoughts here on quarterback, or do you want to talk about running backs? I know you're excited about this promo and everything, but we got to get into the <laughs> running backs, right? Um, there was one thing I think worth mentioning mentioning at, at quarterbacks. It was the thing I noticed most when um, looking at ownership projections first, and I was like, no way is he going to be this slow. But talking through it, I think he will be Kyler Murray. Um, Same like story he, last worth. week. What's that? Yeah, same, same story as last week. Same story as last week. Um, and I'm like, he's not going to be this low. But if you think about it, anybody that's paying out for quarterback is paying for Mahomes. They're not going to pay the hundred dollars extra for Kyler. Um, in general, games with large spreads uh, certainly drives ownership down. Uh, it can be tougher for players to pay off high price tags in those games um, if it really turns into a blowout. But man. Um, we have him, I think, projected as the second highest scoring quarterback on the slate. And to think the second highest scoring quarterback is only going to be three percent owned, and I do think he's going to be low owned. That that's got to be worth some exposure. Um, who to who to uh, pair him with is always kind of frustrating because he spreads the ball out so much. Uh, but hey, for those of you into to narrative street, it is a pretty good revenge spot for Mr. DeAndre Hopkins this week. Um, so yeah, I'd like, I'm, I'm, I like Kyler stacks and I, I do think the Texans have actually some decent bring back options this week. Yeah. It's it tough. I mean, maybe, maybe it does flatten out a little bit and you see Kyler five, six percent. That's where I had him not long ago, but it just, the more I started going through the, the, you know, the cost of that 
stack and how you're going to build it. Like if you start, if you start with DeAndre Hopkins, okay, well you're, you're running out of money real fast with 8,500 Kyler Murray, 7,700 DeAndre Hopkins. And then your second option is a little bit cheaper, but yeah, you still, like you said, you gotta, you gotta fight with Mahomes. You gotta fight with Stafford. You gotta fight with Lamar uh, and, and Brady. So it's, it's going to be tough for people to get all the way up to Kyler. You know, looking at three, bring it back with Nico Collins, baby. Oh, Jesus. I actually kind of like that. Okay, let's talk about running yeah, back. Yeah, like, I, like, like, I like it. <laughs> let, let's talk about Daryl Henderson because on DraftKings, I think it's a slam dunk. 6,600, that is – it's not enough money for what he could possibly do against the Lions. The question is, are you going to be interested in tournaments with all the popularity that's going to follow him? I, st- I still think he'll be popular on FanDuel, even though he's 8K over there. And on Yahoo at $27 should be very popular as well. Well, I don't know. Do you think he's going to get it done again? There's really no evidence that he's not going to be a bell cow here that I've seen. Yeah, there isn't. Um, he's an excellent play. I, I will say he got there a little bit last week by kind of a fluke receiving touchdown, uh, which I wouldn't necessarily count on. Um, and other than that, he hasn't shown like a some sort of massive ceiling. Um, Sony Michelle's like relevant enough to to be annoying. Uh, especially in games that are projected to be potentially a blowout. So like, he's not going to get blowout run. So if, if, if he's going to get there, he's going to have to do it when, you know, the game's close. So like, I, I think he's an excellent play. I think he's pretty much a cash game lock, but I think there's enough reason to, to be wary of eating this chalk in tournaments. It's, it's not as I liked it last week, right? Like when the chalk for when he was 6K last week, I thought it was just like, yeah, you got to play Henderson. He, like you said, yeah. he got there with a, a little bit of help there with the receiving touchdown, but it was still all in all good play by my estimation. Uh, I think Sony Michelle might be banged up. I, I'm having trouble bringing that up to report real quick, but even if he's not banged up, I'm still not that concerned about him jumping in and taking the role. But the, just the off chance that, uh, the, you know, this becomes – the Stafford versus golf ball. I mean, this is, I don't, I don't know if this is a revenge spot. I mean, we, we're, you, you wanted to talk about Hopkins and Murray, <laughs> but I would think that, you know, Jared Goff might be a little bit pissed here. Like if this turns into some kind of a passing shootout, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe that's one of your outs to Henderson not getting there, but I don't, I don't want to downplay it. it it's it's going to be popular in tournaments and you've got a decision to make as to whether or not you want to fade it. Um, presently speaking, I'm just, I'm not ruling him out of my, player pool i just think that it's still a very 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 sharp play against the lions now the daryl williams situation against tennessee i think there's also a conversation to be had here because last week we saw daryl williams get there with a couple of touchdowns um we know he's not going to be the full-time back in this offense but there aren't very many lower priced options to turn to here people are going to look at what happened last week and say yes let's get a kansas city chiefs running back in our lineup are you afraid of Derek Gore, whoever they bring up here, uh, taking away touches from Darrell Williams? Or certainly Jarek McKinnon is there. Or is this another situation where we can trust the first back on the depth chart for Kansas City? Kind of. Um, and this is a little bit different of a stance that I had last week. I kind of came out against him last week saying, like, hey, I'm all in on this Kansas City passing attack. And, of course, he steals two touchdowns last week. Um, couldn't even make one of them a receiving touchdown. Go figure. Um <clears throat> Like he, he saw so much work uh, and it, like I thought McKinnon would eat into him a little bit more than he did considering the matchup last week. Like the, the matchup last week was, was terrible for him in terms of uh, just the, the rushing attack. So I don't know, but eat, eating Daryl Williams chalk never feels good, but like, I, th- I think he's a good play. I, th- I really do think he's a good play. Um, I would just be cognizant of the lineups I'm making him in. Right. Like, if I'm playing uh, Daryl Williams in a lineup, I'm not using a bring back. I don't think from Tennessee. Um, I'm hoping like it's a, it's a lower scoring game. He kind of grinds it out a little bit. Um, and I'm not pairing him with other Kansas city players either. For me, I am going to lean towards the passing games are more active in this game. And if, if I'm making three lineups, uh, I'm probably going to try to see if I can get away without using him just because of how popular he's going to be. However, that's it's also because you've got Chuba at 6.1, who I like. I like Fournette at 6.4. I am growing in you know faith that De- DeAndre Swift will just continue to get used despite the fact that he appears on the injury report 
every week. And I mean, that's the extent of the guys I love. So maybe Williams will end up sneaking in there just because of pricing, but I am going to try to lean on some of those other guys first. Do you, do you like any one of those three guys more than the other? Um, probably Chuba. Like, yeah. And so he, he's got a good role. Yeah. And what do you think of the Giants defense here? Right. So, I mean, we, we don't want to spend too much time worrying about max matchup. We're more worried about opportunity here. Chuba is almost certainly going to have the, the big, big role on this team. They don't have a, they don't, I don't even think they have more than him on the roster that can really be sort of a ball carrier. So what do you, what do you think here? I think, I think Chuba is probably the best of the three as well. Yeah, I think so. I don't think we've seen any sort of ceiling game from him yet either. Like the touches are there. Um, he, he hasn't had a game where he's combined yardage and scoring. He scored his first touchdown last week. Was pretty disappointing in the in the yardage output. But yeah, like maybe maybe that sort of kind of lackluster production is made, having people overlook him. But the the usage has been excellent. Darnold's been all over the place with pressure and stuff too. Like. You know, if you see the number of tar- – if he gets, like, one of these five or six target games like he's had and the yardage is more than, you know, six for 33, I mean, if you if you could bust a long longer receiving play with any one of these targets, I mean, there's certainly some upside on the yardage standpoint. Obviously, I don't think he has uh, – yeah, he has one rushing touchdown here. So, in, in five weeks, I think that there's definitely plenty of upside here for Chuba. He's probably one of my favorites on the slate. Uh, Fournette, of course – against Chicago. I think the matchup's tougher there, but he's got the, he's got a passing game role now, right? Yeah. He, he's he got the full role. He's got everything. Um, the only thing that I would see driving any sort of ownership down again is that I, I could see Brady getting a little bit of steam with those double stacks. Now, now that AB is out just because it is such an easy stack to go to. Sure. But then tell me where, who are you going to roster, right? If you're, if you're a little bit apprehensive on any of these guys, and Fournette's not getting rostered. I mean, you, can you spend up 9200 for Derrick Henry or, God forbid, on FanDuel, 11000 Like, I think he's going to be owned on DraftKings at 9200 but I, I don't see a lot of people getting to 11000 on FanDuel. That is, that, is a, that is a significant chunk of the salary cap uh, for one so player. So probably my, my biggest leak um, in DFS is underestimating Derrick Henry and underestimating – how much people love Derrick Henry. Um, like he's, he's going to get a lot of ownership. I think um, I would not be surprised if he jumps some of these guys um, in the lower price range. Like I think Daryl Henderson will be the guy, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's Derrick Henry right after him. Like I, people will make it work. I understand to us for guys that use projections and are looking at things like it doesn't look that easy to get him in there, but people will make it fit. And like, you got the narrative of how bad Kansas city's defense is too. You have everything lining up for him just to to end up being chalk more in the twenties percent range than where he is right now at seventeen point seven on DK. So what we're going to be looking for, right, is if we think that this is true, right, we're gonna we're gonna break the the modeling, we're gonna make the break the formulas, and we're gonna say Derrick Henry's over twenty percent. What we need to do is we need to find out who at a lower price point at the wide receiver position or the tight end position or even at the running back position is going to be higher on than we are currently projecting because I think that's the secret sauce here, right? Like we need to yep. figure out how we're going to get there. So, and there's a couple of different ways. We'll talk about them here. But okay, so Josh Jacobs, is he going to be a guy who's going to reduce the the Fournet ownership? I mean, he's certainly got some quality projections spitting out here, 1605 uh, on a median basis from Roto Grinders, that's earning him 14% ownership. Is, is this too aggressive for a player who's in a quality game environment, uh, or is are people actually going to feel confident in what he's been doing lately? Um, I don't think it's too aggressive by any stretch. Like, I will say, without Gruden there, John, like Kenyon Drake actually has a role now that that's going to eat into to Jacobs a little bit. Not, not significantly. Um, I still think Drake only had six touches or whatever last week. Um, but frustratingly, and I don't know why with Gruden there, um, Josh Jacobs was like getting screen passes and stuff. And it made absolutely zero sense, sense to me. Um, I don't think he'll have any sort of passing game role, um, which, you know, on a site like DraftKings is not all that appealing, but I do think he'll grab ownership. Um, the guy that I think, will get ownership despite the matchup just because of his current situation that we have pretty low. Um, and he doesn't even project that well. So, I'm, so maybe I'm completely off base here. Uh, Khalil Herbert. 
Um, yeah, people well, I think it depends. Last week, I think it depends because this projection's so low because we haven't been able to remove Williams Williams, from the projections just yet. If we end up removing him from the projections, then obviously you're going to see Herbert's price go up and consequently the ownership percentage should go up right right along with it. But yeah, I think, I mean, that is certainly one way where you could find some extra savings and start to reduce some of the ownerships of these other running backs is to give a little bit to clear Herbert, albeit you, you won't find me playing him against Tampa Bay's defense. I I don't see it at all. I, I, you know, I barely thought, I really saw it when he was in preseason. Like I was afraid of playing this guy in preseason, let alone yeah. in the regular season. Like now last week, he, he came dangerously close to a big game, like a big, big game. They took away that touchdown at the end, but I, I don't think this is the matchup at all. He, he can catch passes, but man, you really want to trust Justin Fields to dump it off? Not really, but I like the, again, it's more of a usage thing um, than anything else. Like it, yeah. it's not a play I love, not necessarily a play I'll make, but I, I do think that's a that's where we could see some ownership pile into. All right, last name I want to mention here, running back before we move on to the wide receivers, is Miles Sanders. So Miles Sanders, uh, last week I think they, they were on the showdown last week, right? If, I, if I'm not mistaken, and I think that there was uh, there was quite a bit of love coming out from our projections Gainwell. for Gainwell, yeah. and Gainwell just didn't get it done. Uh, it was all looking in the direction of Sanders. Speaking of Tampa Bay, that's who they played last week. And yep. you see the production wasn't quite there, even though he was the majority owner of the role in the offense, including some targets this week, the matchup's significantly more favorable for Miles Sanders. Uh, if you give him 50% of the rushing share and an increased share of the targets, I think that he looks pretty good in projections. Do you think that it would translate to real life finally? Yes. Um, and I do think like, it's a thing where he's the best of the low priced options, which is going to make him just, get ownership because of that so Wednesday we do this full cast I I was kind of getting on Dave a little bit for for touting Miles Sanders Um, and this was before the coach speak came out that hey we need to get Miles Sanders more involved their OC came out saying we need to get him more touches Um, because I've I've been caught in this trap before Um, they've really pulled the rug out on their usage and between Sanders and Gainwell and when you think Gainwell's going to get used, he doesn't. Um, <laughs> except for there was one game against Kansas City that made sense. Hey, we're going to use the passing back more in that game, and it, it, it came to fruition. Um, but like I, I was, I was at the beginning of the week. I was, I'm not going to play Miles Sanders. Now I'm kind of like, all right, like I see the appeal for it. I like this Las Vegas passing attack. He's a natural bring back option in that game. Um, I do think he'll be fairly high owned. Oh, I, I, I agree. I'm a little bit concerned that I, that the initial or the uh, Friday run here has gotten a little bit too light on DraftKings at 5,100 on him. He's still at 13%, though. So maybe he could creep up even a little bit higher than that. But I I think that that's probably where you draw the line as far as the chalkier running backs here. And that's quite a few. Uh, you got looks like you got about nine guys that should c- carry the bulk of the ownership. And then anybody else is going to be in the low-owned category. A little bit later in the show, we'll talk about anyone we li- might like in that particular range if you're trying to get really off the board in some of these big contests. Now, a place where you do not have to get really off the board Tuttle is Thrive Fantasy. If you are into player props and you are into DFS, oh boy, Thrive Fantasy is definitely the spot for you. You can go there and prop up this season. Uh, They've got basically a contest that is like DFS, but with player props. And it's only going to be with the top guys. You don't have to mess around uh, with the off the board options. You can eliminate countless hours of research and focus on the top tier athletes that have the biggest impact on the game. Choose 10 out of the 20 available players to build your lineup. Each prop's going to be assigned a, a value for both the over and the under. And basically you have to figure out how likely uh, it is for them to hit and make your wagers and make a lineup. Hit the most and you're going to get your share of the prize pool. Use promo code GRINDERS when you sign up and you will receive a 100% instant first deposit match up to 250 bucks. Go ahead and download the Thrive Fantasy app on the App Store or the Play Store or visit thrivefantasy.com. Sign up and prop up today. Let's talk wide receiver subtle. This is a lot more fun conversation to me than the running back conversation. There are plenty of options to look at here. Chris Godwin at 5.9 is currently topping the numbers right now, but I think that that is razor thin. I think you've got Calvin Ridley at 6.6, who could very well be the highest owned at that level. You've got Cooper Cup at 8.4, who's been smashing this season. Even though he's the most expensive, could certainly reach the pinnacle. 
And then Sterling Shepard at 5.6 in an offense that has almost zero other available targets. Uh, hard to not get him towards the top of ownership if you're expecting the kind of work that he should be getting in this game, especially running out of the slot where there are there's a relative safety to the targets that are going to be assigned to him. What do you think about this? Is Devontae Adams going to jump up here? Or are we really talking about these guys as the four highest name guys? I think you're probably talking about those guys as the highest known guys. Um, and it's not like we don't have Adams projected for decent ownership still. Uh, like this is kind of what I was alluding to earlier though, is that this wide receiver position is so strong up top. And then it drops like you, you want to not eat chalk, right? You're looking for some contrarian options, but you, you take a look at these guys. There's so many strong plays here. It's, it's hard to find which guy you would want to take a pivot off of. Like to me, maybe Sterling Shepard. Um, and that would be more of a bet against the giants offense in general than his role in the offense, because the role in the offense is, is excellent. Uh, he's just going to eat targets. Um, so, Again, like these guys are so such so, such good options overall that it's it's hard to get away from some of this wide receiver chalk when when building lineups. Yeah, I mean Cooper Cup against the Lions is just whew, that is juicy. But at the same time, you know, like Robert Woods is significantly cheaper. And once upon a time, these two had an interchangeable role in this offense. And it just seems Stafford has been gravitating towards Cup and what he's able to do out there more so than Woods. But if honestly, I, I think it's it's probably closer in terms of like, I, I don't know, maybe you can tell me about the snap usage or the, the route usage for Woods. Is it lower than what's what's out there for Cup? Or is this simply a situation where the roulette wheel has just landed more times on Cup than Woods? Um, at the beginning of the season, I remember after week one, I was like, wow, Woods is seeing some decreased usage. I don't know why. Um, and Van Jefferson has had kind of stepped up, but that swung back. Woods is on the field. Uh, Woods ran more routes than Cup last week. Um, it's definitely just like, hey, they have a connection. Like, it's undeniable. He's just, Stafford and Cup just have a connection. Um, and why would – like, the only game that we saw Woods really get fat is when he was kind of deeply uh, displeased with the situation and not getting enough targets. Like, that could happen again. The thing is, the matchup's so good that I, it would not be surprising to be like, all right, let, let, let's get uh, Robert Woods involved this game. Like, this is the game that we can do anything we want. Uh, let's, you know – feed the squeaky wheel or, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I'm, de- I, you know, there's, this is definitely a situation with Godwin and cup where if the alternates are going to be so much lower owned uh, than the guy. Now Evans is more expensive than Godwin at 5.9. Who's a fantastic option here, but Evans I think is going to be pretty low. So I, I, I would much prefer yeah. to pivot off these other guys. And I, well, I don't think the ownership gaps as they're currently projected are fair compared to their opportunities to be the most productive option in the offense of course they we could we could have it both ways and double stack them in both cases so you know don't feel the need to just completely ignore cooper cup and chris godwin but just again there's there's some popularity concerns here at the top of wide receiver i mentioned Devonte adams play him he's good uh what about below that I, I i see some pretty disgusting choices here with jacoby myers and rashad bateman now i shouldn't say bateman is disgusting he's just never been he's never done it before but he's 3.4 and we're projecting him for almost double digit points. Actually, we, we have him just over double digit fantasy points on DraftKings at 10.6. I mean, are you buying Rashad Bateman chalk? Um, I am buying that he will be owned, yes. Um, am I buying and investing in him heavily? No. Um, like you said, we, we haven't seen it before. I, like, I think he's a, he's a fine player. Um, but it, like, I think this game will be slower paced. I wouldn't be surprised if it's, it's more run heavy. I wouldn't be surprised if Lamar Jackson's volume is just not where it needs to be for somebody like the third option to actually pop and, and do well in a game. Um, if he else is a touchdown, he's probably going to be optimal. That's kind of just how it goes. But um, yeah, he, he's one of the guys that once we start trickling down in ownership, now we're starting to, to get a little bit more thin plays here. Yeah. So my, I wouldn't really call Jacoby Myers a thin play, but my question is, do people actually want to play him? Because I think if if you're projecting him for 15 fantasy points almost, people should want to play him. Are, are, are they, are they going to do it? He hasn't scored a touchdown his entire life. Yeah, he's um, – Well, NFL. Yeah, he, he he's still seeing, like, just enough volume to keep the light on. Um, 
and seeing just enough efficiency that it, like I don't think people will shy away from playing him. Like I don't, I don't think if somebody lands on Jacoby Myers bill, they're like, oh no, I got to I got to switch this up. And the problem is like he fits a lot of builds, uh, which will drive ownership for sure. The poor guy gets in the end zone last week, and then the, yeah. and you just look on the screen, and you knew it was coming. The yellow the yellow flag comes out. I forget what the he call was. was he was but... so happy too. The celebration oh, was man. great. Look, he gets look. Few people get to do it twice, so he'll get he'll get to do it all over again. Maybe this week. Okay, so AJ Brown six point three. Kansas City Chiefs have been bad on defense. Um, I hate to repeat myself here, Tuttle, and I'm not saying I like I'm a firm believer in Julio Jones, but if you want to run it back with on the Kansas City side. Uh, if you got a Kansas City stack, or even if you're trying to do a Tannehill stack for some reason, like AJ Brown is fantastic. I think he has a great chance to do something here. But is Julio Jones really going to be like a sixth of the the you know the potential to do something in this game as AJ Brown? <laughs> so the issue here, right? Um, you ask like if people really want to play Jacoby Myers people really don't want to play Julio Jones and I know this because I I really don't want to play Julio Jones um the guy Weird. pulls his hand yeah. every other week um last week he, he didn't even finish the game because of a hammy and it's like I, I could see it being the ugly play that gets there because of the matchup um I don't want to make the play it's one of those where it's like you should make the play <laughs> I don't want to do it because I do think AJ Brown's like AJ Brown's not going to be sneaky at all. Um, he's one that I could see, see rise up in terms of projected ownership, just because people, you know, like the game environment and he's the the pretty clear option for Tennessee. Um, I don't want to play Julio Jones, but again, like if you're just playing game theory, <laughs> he's, he's a great play. Yeah. And but again, at the same time, AJ Brown 6.3 is going to fit your build fairly nicely even if with or without a stack of this game so there's there's definitely an opportunity for him to be popular in this particular spot a guy who doesn't fit builds all quite as well if you're not stacking is Tyreek Hill I don't think he'll be that owned but 13 percent is still plenty when you talk about uh NFL DFS ownership if we're talking NBA we wouldn't be having the same conversation but with NFL that's certainly going to get the job done for a player who can get 50 now Brandon Cooks probably can't get 50, but he certainly got the usage if he was on a good team to get 50. So is, is 6K Brandon Cooks on your radar here currently projecting at 12% ownership? He is. Um, and the Cardinals have been fairly giving to opposing wideouts this season. Some of it's because they're just playing with a lead a lot, so they're facing a, a pretty high pass rate. Um, so, yeah, I, I like Cooks a decent amount. The, the thing I have if I'm playing Cooks um, – I think he'll be popular in game stacks or secondary stacks of that game, which, so it, it almost makes you want to play cooks outside of those stacks, because I think that'll be the more unique way to grab exposure to him, which then brings me to the Nico Collins call. I had a little bit earlier on the show. I, I do like, I don't expect Nico Collins to have nearly as good of a game as Brandon cooks. Like that's not going to happen. Or if it does, I'll be happy. Um, but I do prefer Nico Collins and game stacks because I do think that will get you unique exposure to that game and to those stacks. Whereas, you know, playing Kyler Murray, DeAndre Hopkins and Brandon cooks, that's going to be a, a fairly used lineup to construction. Yeah. It might be too low on Nico Collins to be honest with you. Like you're not the first person I've heard mention this and you know, we are looking for some ways to maybe bump that Kyler Murray ownership up a little bit. We're looking to bump up some of the other expensive guys like your Derek Henry you know, a 3K guy might get you there a little bit more often. And so maybe maybe he's one of the people that gets that slides up the board here as we try to increase the t- ownership of the high ex- high price players on DraftKings. I don't think we'll see that on FanDuel as much. Um, Marquise Brown is 5.8. Uh, his, his primary usage will be in stacks with Lamar Jackson. I do not think people want to stack this game. And maybe I'm wrong, Tuttle. I mean, are you are you excited to run it back with any of these Bengals? Jamar Chase is always fun, um, but I'm with you. It's not like people are chomping at the bit to, to stack this game. It, it just kind of screams like a gross, low-paced game. We kind of saw what the what Baltimore was able to do to the Chargers last week, and I think there's that fear um, with this game environment. Like, I, I think it's an okay 
game to stack. You do like Chase has big play potential. Marquise Brown has big play potential. I think instead of full out stacking, if I wanted to do something with this game, it would be more of a secondary stack with Marquise mm-hmm. Brown and, and Jamar Chase. Higgins has disappointed us a little bit here. I mean, mostly because, you know, you've got Jamar Chase out there just catching bombs like all over the place. And Higgins, you know, he's he's not really – getting I thought he might be closer to the one in this offense preseason and certainly got a good amount of targets uh in his, in his act I mean five is the fewest targets he's got in the game we're just not seeing the yardage come with that and we're certainly not seeing the touchdowns which we're really going to need in DFS if we want to win tournaments is this a situation where the sample size is too small in Higgins or you know is this really how it's going to be it's always going to be Chase um sample size is definitely too small to make any sort of definitive conclusion i do think like chase is gonna be the guy um i don't know how big of an ex- like how what the gap's gonna be I, I still think there's room for higgins i think higgins will have spiked weeks i think higgins is the guy in the red zone um so like he still has this role he still has touchdown equity um fine play but like you said he's kind of just been mm, okay the past couple of weeks I'm going to write off a couple of guys to end their wide receiver segment. I want you to tell me which one of these guys is the best potential to rise in ownership in order to fit Derrick Henry on really either side. I got Miko Hardman, Darnell Mooney, Hunter Renfro, Jalen Watt. Any of, any of those guys stand to rise in their ownership projections? Oh, I got one more. Tyler Johnson on DraftKings, 3K. Uh, Miko Hardman, I think pretty yeah. easily. But I think he, Tyler Johnson – you think he will? I don't know. Uh, he's three K, and I don't think yeah. his projection's that great. But he's with Tom Brady, and if you're trying to make us, you know, if you're trying to make it work, I think they're like, you know, you mentioned secondary correlations. If you wanted to get real dastardly, you know, Mooney and Tyler Johnson as a secondary is real cheap. I'm not saying that's great. I'm just saying that that mm. that is an existing <laughs> secondary st- correlation stack that is cheap. So right. I mean, it, but Hardman makes the most sense, obviously, because you know you go with. Uh, with him at 4.3 and you, and especially if you don't stack one of the quarterbacks there, uh, you know, you're talking about a real cheap secondary stack there as well. Uh, but nobody else has shown out. like a decent floor too recently. Anybody else was I mean, what about Waddle? He had a big game in London. Yeah, I do like, like the, the beginning of the week. So when I look at ownership now, other than Calvin Ridley, no one's spiking from this, um, the poop bowl or whatever you want to want to call it. Like this game could be, be a fairly decent game in terms of fantasy points being scored um it's not the most attractive game to watch in terms of how good these teams actually are um but like beginning of the week i thought we'd see a little bit more ownership on the quarterbacks to uh matt ryan and the receiving options as well so yeah like waddle's seeing enough targets for sure that i would not be surprised if he got a, a little bit of ownership but like now with Godwin opened up, like th- there's so much competition in his price range that it makes sense that he's currently projected for fairly low ownership. I need to watch the news on Devontae Parker. I did not see what his final designation ended up being as far as his practice statuses were concerned, but he's very cheap if he ends up playing. Uh, mm-hmm. He's 5.6 on FanDuel, which is just whew, very cheap, $15 on Yahoo. Uh, and of course, 5k on DraftKings. So I mean, that, that is definitely a very cheap stack. Two is not expensive either. And you mentioned Calvin Ridley. I mean, that, that stack definitely gives you a bunch of upside on the cheap there. Of course, then you're relying on some players that we don't normally like to roster. So that is the downside of that. Okay, let's get into the tight end position as we move along here in the show. And the tight end position is on FanDuel is pretty easy to decipher. Uh, you you know you're usually just going in and play, paying up for the studs like Darren Waller uh, or Travis Kelsey. I mean the t- the cap's definitely a little bit tighter this week, but the reason I mentioned this on Fanduel first title is because if you want to go kick the garbage out of three of the originals of DFS, go ahead and sign up for the DFS OGs league on the Roto Grinders homepage. Go out there and play against Beer Makers fan, Head Chopper, and Notorious. Again, that link is on the RG homepage for week seven go ahead and, and beat their asses and uh get your share of the prize pool today okay ricky steals jones on DraftKings is going to be really popular because he's still 3.7 i think that's right i mean we definitely want to have travis kelsey we want to have darren waller but i think ultimately with all the other guys we want to pay for tight end position ends up being where people are going to save do you think so 
think so. I, I have been a little bit surprised that he hasn't got like he was obviously a slam dunk the last two weeks. Um, and he it, like the tone I'm getting um, is that he's not this week. And that surprises me a little bit. I don't know why. Um, so I, I guess all that to say, I think he's a good play. Um, but I guess I would not be surprised if his ownership was a little bit lower than what we think. Um, just getting a general feeling from the industry in general. Okay. So once again, same question. If we're not saving with 3.7 Ricky Seals Jones, are we saving with someone like, I don't know, Cole commit at 3k? Like where is the ownership going? Or, I mean, quite frankly, are we really jacking up these other positions and paying up for Dallas Goddard, paying up for Mike Kosicki, paying up for Darren Waller? Like, what, what's what's happening here? If you're going to say it's not Seals Jones up top, where is the salary savings coming from? And consequently, who's owned at tight end? Yeah, it gets tough <laughs> because, yeah, I don't know where you would put this. Um, Kelsey's just too expensive to, to soak up too much ownership. Um, Darren Waller's probably too expensive to do the same thing. I will say it's probably Mark Andrews. Like uh, looking back, I opened up the the Millie maker from last week and the guy that stood out to me as why, or like how he got that high in ownership was Mark Andrews. He was, he was one of the highest owned players on the entire slate, not just at the tight end position. Yes. He was $800 cheaper last week. Um, but he was the guy. He, he came in at 25% in the Millie Maker last week. Well, he scored 45 fantasy points a week before, of course. I like, I mean, like, yeah, I'm, but I'm, it's like... I'm a little upset with myself for not like being more aggressive with that. <laughs> Every year, there's like one or two weeks where that happens. We forget, we all think that we're, we're over recency bias and we're over just looking at the game logs. And then, and then once or twice a year, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, it was Mark Ingram scored three touchdowns in a game. He had a terrible projection and he was like 20% owned. And that yep. was your, that's your Mark Andrews from last week, you know. Uh, I, I don't he know still scored history. 18 points last week. Yeah, but I mean, he's still 6K. See, I'm with you, but like as projection guys, it's like if I, I'm not paying 6K for Mark Andrews, if, if I'm paying up, I'm just going to play Darren Waller or Travis Kelsey, right? Like that's our thought. But these guys yeah. are like, hey, Mark Andrews, we're playing this dude. FanDuel, thank you for 6.8. DraftKings, he's 6.7. FanDuel, he's 6.8. So, okay, we'll go ahead and get – Darren Waller in the lineup on FanDuel people. I mean, that's, yep. that's not too difficult. Uh, guy's going to crush anyway. Like just, it, it hasn't really happened as often lately as we've seen in seasons past. Like this is the, you know, this is the dip that we've been waiting to buy, right? Like this role hasn't changed. This is, he's still the guy in this offense, right? Like maybe, maybe the receivers have elevated themselves a little bit here, but God, he's still got like 30 in him, right? Yeah, I mean the the thing is the targets have been pretty underwhelming, right? Like it's it's like he came out with the 19 target or whatever target game he, to start the season, and then since then it's kind of been um, let me bring it up here. It, it it's been seven or so, so um, so at 19, seven, 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 eight, five. Um, so it hasn't been like the the huge role we would want from somebody, but I think. Like he's good. He's he's such a good player. Like maybe that's the bias coming through on me, and like maybe I should be saying, hey, maybe this is a role reduction. But in my mind, I'm just like he's too good to to see this low of targets. Like I I would bet on him getting double digit targets in this spot more than hitting the five targets he got last week. Uh, another player who's pretty good is Dallas Goddard, and he's on the other side of this game. He's four point six as opposed to six point seven on DraftKings. Uh, so even though he is pretty cheap. On FanDuel, and he'll be he'll be popular there. I still don't think uh, he'll be as popular as Waller there, but more popular than Waller on DraftKings, just because it's certainly going to be easier to slide him into that roster than the six point seven. Are you buying Dallas Goddard here with no Zach Ertz? Um, yes, good play. Um, ownership with Hertz will drive his ownership up. Just really do think Hertz is going to be owned. Like I, I agree with all this. Um, is Devonte Smith just the alpha now? Is he the guy that's just going to get all the targets now? Like they didn't have a Devonte Smith the last couple of years in this offense, um, which is when we saw them really utilize the tight end position. Tight end position hasn't been utilized quite as much. Like Ertz had a decent game before he left. Um, I'm probably going to be short on Dallas Goddard this week. I think I think he's a good play, but I, th- I think you could question if he's getting steamed a little too much. Yeah, especially since if you do see a, like a good amount of Raider stacks. 
um, you know, even if it's only like 5% Raider stocks or something like that, I mean, that's just going to chip away at that ownership and drive them up a little bit. Uh, I'm not, I'm not saying don't play Dallas Goddard. I, I, I'll probably end up playing it just because I've been waiting for so long, but Jesus, uh, you'd like to do it at low ownership if you could. Okay. So defense is a spot where we definitely want to try to play guys at lower ownership if we can. The Cardinals, the problem is, are playing the Houston Texans and Davis Mills, and they're just 3.1. So I think we're going to see one of those weeks where we have a pretty chalky defense here on our hands on DraftKings. Don't think we'll see it quite as much on Fandle, but on DraftKings, we're definitely going to be playing the Cardinals. Do you disagree with that? I do not disagree with that. Who else are we playing? Are we? Are any? Is anyone else getting above this 8% mark? I got five teams above that. Right now, I've got the Giants at 2.5, the Patriots against Zach Wilson and the Jets at 3.4, and the Jets themselves at 2.4, merely as a price play uh, to go along with the Ravens at 2.9 against Cincinnati. Are we missing anybody here? Is anyone else going to eclipse chalk status on defense? No. Um, and I think that I think what could happen is the Giants – soak up some of the ownership you just talked about with Baltimore and, and even the Jets. I think I do think yeah. the Giants stand out as like the low price defense. So I, I would not be surprised to see them pull more of a 15 to 20% range. I'll buy it. I mean, I certainly don't want it to be I, actually, you know, I don't care, but cause you know, if I, if I'm on Chuba and Chuba is just going absolutely ham on the Giants defense and uh, at least, you know, reducing that uh, points uh, allowed score a little bit here as long as they don't uh get to sam Darnold too much then you know that certainly could be a chalk bust though i'm not saying don't play the giants once again i'm just saying that in in the universe where i'm going to play some chupa hubbard i do like the idea that the giants will be a little bit popular in that sense but you know again the cardinals are just so far and away uh the most obvious play that i do think that that's a little concerning to to, to dial them up as bad as davis mills is <laughs> Like I just I hate going to twenty percent owned defenses, and that's really what we're going to see here. So that that gets tough. Any other thoughts on defense before we get to the low on plays? Um, I mean, mostly sim- similar to what it is uh, we, what we say every week. Pay up to be contrarian, possibly with, with Tampa Bay here. I I'm not paying up for a five K defense for the Rams, so I do have my limits with the, the with the pay up to be contrarian. Um, but I, I would be fine with the with you know rostering Tampa Bay if you want to do. Here's a question for you. And I do think talking through this, I, I do think it will be lower owned. Um, Fournette, Bucks, is that correlation going to be lower owned than Brady Stacks? Fournette, Bucks, Brady Stacks. So it, it, I don't, yes, I think that's that. That depends what site you're talking about, though. Because on FanDuel, the Buccaneers defense is the yeah, stone we'll chalk. They're like, yeah. they're like 4,400. So you're going to see plenty of Fournette plus yep. Buccaneers on FanDuel on DraftKings. No, I mean, you're going to see, you're going to see more Brady and wide receiver stacks there just because you've yep. got the three K Tyler Johnson. You've got a an not yet mentioned uh, t- tight end position uh, for Tampa Bay that could end up garnering uh, a, a little bit of uh, popularity there as far as the double stacks are concerned. So yeah, I do think that the Brady stack will be more owned than the correlation of Fournette versus Buccaneers. And we know Justin Fields, at this juncture hasn't proven to us that he's anything to be feared just yet. So, uh, you know, I'm definitely into that particular idea. Now at the yeah. quarterback position for low on place title, what we're going to, what we're lo- looking to do is find guys who are under the chalk status. This we'll call it 5% today. And I want you to tell me about your favorite play that you think could be in a GPP winning lineup in one of these larger field contests. Um. So if we're doing the easy calls, I like the, the the two very easy calls for me are Kyler and Tom Brady. Um, those are the the very very easy calls I think, and I, I like like I like Kyler a lot. Um, we think we get this every every season um, where we think we know what's going to happen in a game because it just seems like such a big mismatch, um, and either the blowout happens and the quarterback still gets there, which is certainly possible in this spot. Or the game is more competitive and it ends up, you know, shooting out. Um, not not all that confident that Texans make this a shootout, uh, but I do think there's a chance that Kyler gets there um, and not need a full game to get there. Um, the other maybe not so obvious, but I could see catching ownership would be Ryan Tannehill. Uh, 
I've tried to do the Ryan Tannehill thing multiple times this season, and it, it has not worked yet. Uh, we saw it work a lot last season, honestly. Like, it, it worked. It, it, it had a fairly high hit rate um, last, se- last season. I don't know if it's just the absence of Arthur Smith. They're not throwing the ball quite as much as, as potentially a thing. Um, but Tannehill does jump out as a, as a pretty strong leverage stack off of uh, Derrick Henry. Okay, and I'll just mention a couple of more. I don't have a lot of conviction about either of these yet because I haven't fully generated my process of, of lineups here as far as what I'm definitely going to use. So I'll just talk about some spots that I think could go over the totals if they get the right conditions happening in the game. The first one you already mentioned is the Miami and Atlanta spot. The Atlanta defense yeah. is not very good, and if the Atlanta offense is good enough to produce points against a Miami, a tougher Miami Dolphins secondary, which – I would imagine a veteran like Matt Ryan every now and then could pull that out of his bag. Then you can start to see some points in that game. But I do want to talk about Aaron Rodgers versus uh, Heineke in, in Green Bay. What's the temperature like out there these days, Tuttle? What are we looking at for Sunday? Because if that's not going to be like the frozen tundra of Lambeau yeah. Field, uh, it's easy for me to see the Packers getting out to a lead. And then all of a sudden now we've got uh, you know a hobbled Gibson no longer – you know, maybe in his full row and we're in McKissick mode and now we're, now we're playing catch up and there's definitely some stacks that you could make with green Bay versus Washington. And I think that's going to be low owned across the board. So I think that that is certainly a situation that could get overlooked. I mean, can you see it happening? Can this happen? Can we have a high scoring green Bay Washington game? I think so. So 100%. um, And that was honestly the one that stuck out, stood out to me. I think um, last week kind of key was, the second highest owned quarterback. I'm like, what's what what really is the big difference between a matchup against Kansas City and Green Bay? Pace is the biggest thing that I thought of. Like Green Bay plays at a pretty plays at a pretty slow play pace. Uh, but it's basically the same theory behind the play is that you know it's gonna be they're gonna be forced to throw the ball. Um and now we have Heineke projected for under two percent ownership at a six hundred dollar decrease from last week when he was fifteen to twenty percent owned. Like I understand he's not that appealing of a play. It's not fun. It's not fun to roster him, uh, but Heineke plus McLaurin, I'm all about that. Yeah, and 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 I think there's some uh, you know there's some interesting like looks on Green Bay as well. The tight end, uh, maybe we can chat about him in a little bit. But oh, uh, you, you, yeah, I know. But you know, you've also got um, you also got the running back Aaron Jones, who I'm going to mention right now as a player who is going yeah. to be under 10 percent owned and who's very expensive. So this is why we're not seeing him rise up their ownership ranks here. Uh, you've got A.J. Dillon now lurking, but at any given point in time, he's got the the outcome curve that reaches the, you know, the upper echelons of break the slate levels. And if it happened to reach that in that game, I think Aaron Jones, again, if you're, you can use him probably in a stack, which would be expensive, or you could use him just as the, you know, Hey, he's, he's under 10% owned pivot off of other running backs as a way to get contrarian. But I think that there's some interesting spots here in this green Bay, Washington game. Aaron Jones is one of them. Yes, I agree. Um, he stood out ownership wise. Um, like there is some concern that at Dylan's kind of role is expanding a little, a little bit. So you're going to need him to, you're, you're really going to need some sort of efficiency out of Jones. If he, if he's going to hit, but it, I would say his is like this isn't any different from the Aaron Jones we've seen in the past. Um, he's always been a guy that's not necessarily going to he- see huge volume, yet he still sees these forty point spike weeks. So completely on board with Aaron Jones. Um, I had some but somebody else that I really don't want to tout. Um, Let's hear it. <sighs> complete dust, completely washed. Um, James Connor. Similar story to the to the Fournette Sheesh. Tampa Bay take James Conner Cardinals D although Cardinals D is going to be high owned, um, but it's kind of the same theory. Like he has established himself as the goal line back. He's established himself as the grinder back. Um, the case against Kyler Murray in the passing attack would be that the Cardinals have took their foot off the pedal and blow us this season. Like in the past, they've still kind of kept the kept the pace going up. That hasn't been the case this season. Um, they're kind of more ready to just hand the ball off to James Conner. So like, I, got, I don't like James Conner. Um, I don't like his prototype of a player who's only going to get there on touchdowns and carries and volume. Um, but like, is this a spot where he could easily get two touchdowns in a hundred yards? Yes, it is. 
I wish I was getting more lineup benefits for my troubles at 5.6 there, but I totally yeah. get it. It's like, it, it is, you know, it's it, from just a, if, you know, if we were just picking, playing a pick them with no salary cap, I would definitely like Connor a lot more, but uh, man, if I, I, I want the savings if I'm going to have to go to that particular player and uh, the, you know, the targets on DraftKings is always tough when, you know, you don't really know if you're going to get any kind of target volume from Connor. Not that he doesn't really have that in his bag. It's just, they have, have Chase Edmonds to, to do that sort of a thing. And he's not, I think he looks like he's good to go, but again, I, I totally get it. And it, it's definitely a spot where you could see the touchdowns come. And I think that that's the important thing to key on there. Okay. What about wide receiver? Give me, give me a, give me a winner here at wide receiver Tuttle. Um, I mean, you mentioned it with Heineke, the guy that I had written down as my favorite was McLaurin. Um, he's still the guy. He's still really good. Um, it's just been, things haven't been breaking his way. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins is the other guy that I had written down. Um, and we talked a little bit about Woods going, uh, you know, being the guy over cup Van Jefferson. It, it's an ugly play, <laughs> but like, if you're looking for a pivot off of Bateman, who's going to be a little bit chalkier, um, why not take the guy with the team that's going to definitely score a lot of points. And it's just a matter of how they score them. Yeah. Those, those are definitely some, some quality choices. I, I, I mentioned Julio. I, don't, don't, don't kill me for mentioning Julio again, but I mean, he's 6.1. Uh, that's not particularly expensive. Um, I, you, you can't really convince me to fall into the Allen Robinson trap again, but he's only 5.1. So God, I mean, like, he's not going to be that's owned. Sad. Uh, so I, don't quote me on that one, but that's it, it's available to you if you're brave enough. Mike Evans, I'm gonna okay. Let's talk about Mike Evans for a second. I don't. How old is Mike Evans going to be this week? Because if he's going to be under like nine percent owned, I, I have him at six right now. Like I think that's fantastic. I mean, he's you know he's certainly going to have to beat a matchup that has slowed down opposition passing games more than I thought they would so far this season. But I, I think Evans and Brady could be a combination that beats any matchup. So there's a guy who could get it done at low ownership. And then finally, I just wanted to, to mention one more guy on the disturbing side of things. Tuttle, you, you, you mentioned a sick one. I'm going to give you a sick one about Corey Davis at 5.2. No one's playing Corey Davis, right? Like it, nobody's it, playing Corey Davis. Did, did CD lamb do anything against the new England Patriots defense? Now I'm not trying to compare Dak to Zach Wilson, but you get the idea. Like this is not an impenetrable defense and he's, he's actually got salary savings associated with them too. So that's certainly a situation where no one's playing him and he's going to be 1% owned and he's got over 20 DraftKings fantasy point upside. Go ahead and maybe risk that if you're playing the millionaire maker. Okay. You got anybody at tight end? I mean, Tunyon's the guy that you were alluding to earlier that I didn't really want to sign off on. No, um, don't do it then. Yeah. I don't know if I can. Um, really the thesis is, is the same with him, right? Like, not going to be heavy volume, but if he gets a touchdown or two at the price he's at, it's a good spot. Um, but no, the guys that I, I wrote up, if you just look at um, the high, like there's actually pretty good high upside options that are coming in low on this week. Darren Waller being one on DraftKings, TJ Hawkinson, um, Kyle Pitts. Like we know these guys actually have legitimate ceilings, which makes me a little bit excited to think that um, they're going to come in at such lower ownership. But I, I do think tight end, if you, if it's a, it is a position to me if you're not playing Ricky Seals Jones to try to pay up a little bit. Yeah, I do think Pitts is the guy. I think you wanted to mention here. You mentioned Mark Andrews is just six k. Nobody's playing Kyle Pitts at five point nine, and yet you look at what he was able to do last week. You would take twenty six point nine in a tournament every single time, folks. That is going to do it for the ownership report here in Week Seven. Uh, Tuttle, I wish you the best of luck in your contest. Best of luck to everyone in your respective contests out there. For RotorGrinders.com, I'm Chris Germino. We'll be back again next week. Go win something. 